Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Stave 2 of A Christmas Carol. I hope you enjoyed Stave 1. Uh, the download numbers have been insane. It is so awesome to see so many people enjoying this uh, podcast, enjoying uh, all the work that we put into this audio drama. Uh, this week we're bringing you Stave 2, which is Chapter 2 of A Christmas Carol. Uh, it just keeps getting better and better. I'm already working on Stave 3 and getting that all edited up. And uh, yeah, it is, this, this audio drama is just blowing my mind. And uh, I hope it is blowing your mind as well. So thank you so much for listening. Remember that all the proceeds from the sale of the, of the full audiobook of the audio drama are going to benefit Operation Christmas Child. So what I want you to do is go to anotherworldaudiobooks.com and the link is down below as well as the instructions but if you just go to anotherworldaudiobooks.com make it super easy for you to find all the links to go ahead and pre-order the audiobook. And the way you do that is just go to Operation Christmas Child's website and donate and then send me an email of the receipt of your donation to Another World Audio books at gmail.com so basically your your proof of donation is uh basically a voucher to get you the full version of the audiobook once it launches so um if you want to do that i would really appreciate it we are um you know that's the whole reason we came together to do this was to raise money for operation christmas child and you get a free uh, awesome audio drama as a thank you for donating to operation christmas child and really there i can't think of a better organization to be supporting during this time just bringing christmas to kids around the world who need it so now, without further ado, I bring you stave two of A Christmas Carol. When Scrooge awoke, it was so dark that looking out of bed, he could scarcely distinguish the transparent window of the opaque walls of his chamber. He was endeavouring to pierce the darkness with his ferret eyes when the chimes of a neighbouring church struck the four quarters. So, he listened for the hour. To his great astonishment, the heavy bell went from six to seven and from seven to eight, and regularly up to twelve, then stopped. Twelve. It was past two when he went to bed. The clock was wrong. An icicle must have gotten the works. Twelve. Why, it isn't possible that I can have slept through a whole day and far into another night. It isn't possible that anything has happened to the sun, and this is twelve at noon. The idea being an alarming one, he scrambled out of bed and groped his way to the window. He was obliged to rub the frost off with the sleeve of his dressing gown before he could see anything, and could see very little then. All he could make out was that it was still very foggy and extremely cold, and that there was no noise of people running to and fro and making a great stir, as there unquestionably would have been if night had beaten off bright day and taken possession of the world. This was a great relief to Scrooge's confused mind. He went to bed again, and thought, and thought, and thought it over, and over, and over, and could make nothing of it. The more he thought, the more perplexed he was, and the more he endeavoured not to think, the more he thought. Marley's ghost bothered him exceedingly. Every time he resolved within himself, after mature inquiry, that it was all a dream, his mind flew back again like a strong spring released to its first position, and presented the same problem to be worked all through. Was it a dream, or not? Scrooge lay in this state until the chimes had gone three quarters more, when he remembered of a sudden that the ghost had warned him of a visitation when the bell tolled one. He resolved to lie awake until the hour was past, and considering that he could no more go to sleep than go to heaven, this was perhaps the wisest resolution in his power. The quarter was so long that he was once more convinced he must have sunk into a doze unconsciously and missed the clock. At length, it broke upon his listening ear. A quarter past. Half past. A quarter to it. The hour itself, and nothing else. He spoke before the hour bell sounded, which it now did with the deep, dull, hollow, melancholy one. Light flashed up in the room upon the instant, and the curtains of his bed were drawn. The curtains of his bed were drawn aside, I tell you, by a hand. Not the curtains at his feet, nor the curtains at his back, but those to which his face was addressed. 
The curtains of his bed were drawn aside, and Scrooge, starting up into a half-recumbent attitude, found himself face to face with the unearthly visitor who drew them. As close as I am now to you, and I am standing in the spirit at your elbow. It was a strange figure, like a child, yet not so much like a child as like an old person, viewed through some supernatural medium, which gave it the appearance of having receded from the view and being diminished to a child's proportion. Its hair, which hung about his neck and down its back, was white as if with age, and yet the face had not a wrinkle in it, and the tenderest bloom was on the skin. The arms were very long and muscular, the hands the same, as if its hold were of uncommon strength. Its legs and feet, most delicately formed, were, like those upper members, bare. It wore a tunic of the purest white, and round its waist was bound a lustrous belt, the sheen of which was beautiful. It held a branch of fresh green holly in its hand, and, in singular contradiction of that wintry emblem, had its dress trimmed with summer flowers. But the strangest thing about it was that from the crown of its head there sprung a bright clear jet of light, by which all this was visible, and which was doubtless the occasion of its using, in its duller moments, a great extinguisher for a cap which it now held under its arm. Even this, though, when Scrooge looked at it with increasing steadiness, was not its strangest quality. For as its belt sparkled in glitter, now in one part and now in another, and what was light one instant at another time was dark, so the figure itself fluctuated in its distinctness, being now a thing with one arm, now with one leg, now with twenty legs, now a pair of legs without a head, now a head without a body, of which dissolving parts no outline would be visible in the dense gloom wherein they melted away. And in the very wonder of this, it would be itself again, distinct and clear as ever. Are you the spirit whose coming was foretold to me? I am. Who and what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? No. Your past. Your light. It's so bright. Pray, could you... Would you please put on your cap? What? Would you so soon put out with worldly hands the light I give? Is it not enough that you are one of those whose passions made this cap and forced me through whole trains of years to wear it low upon my brow? Oh, oh I meant no offence. I profess I never had any knowledge of willfully bulleting you, spirit, at any period of my life. Might I make bold to inquire what business brought you here? Your welfare. Ah, I see. Well, I am much obliged, but I can't help thinking that a night of unbroken rest would have been much more conducive to that end. Your reclamation, then. Take heed. Rise and walk with me. But, Spirit, the weather, the hour... This night is not adapted to pedestrian purposes. Uh, my bed is warm. The thermometer's way below freezing. I'm merely attired in my slippers, dressing gown and nightcap. I have a cold upon me and... Come to the window. But, but I, I'm mortal and, and liable to fall. Bear but a touch of my hand there. And you shall be upheld in more than this. Good heaven, we're up! But how? I, I, I was bred in this place. I was a boy here. Good heaven. Your lip 
his trembling. And what is that upon your cheek? Uh, nothing. Nothing. It's, it's just a pimple. Spirit, lead me where you will. You recollect the way? Remember it? I could walk it blindfold. Strange to have forgotten it for so many years. Let us go on. It's exactly as I recall it. Why, that gate there, it leads to our favourite apple orchard. And that tree over yonder, that's the tree that we would climb to catch a view if it was coming down the road. And there, that post, oh, was a post. Why? It can't be. That's Albie Simpson and Nathaniel Austin and Stanley Howard. Boys, it's old Ebenezer. These are but shadows of the things that have been. They have no consciousness of us. The school is not quite deserted. A solitary child, neglected by his friends, is left there still. Yes. Yes, I know it. Look, Scrooge. The boy sits, lonely by the feeble fire, a book his only companion. You know him, do you not? Know him? He is... He is me. Poor boy. All alone. Poor, poor boy. But you weren't all alone, were you, Scrooge? Your box kept you company. Look. Why? It's Ali Baba. It's dear old honest Ali Baba. Yes, yes, I know. One Christmas time, when yonder solitary child was left here all alone, he did come for the first time just like that. Poor boy. And Valentine and his wild brother, Orson. There they go. Ah, oh, what was his name? It was put down in his drawers, asleep at the gate of Damascus. Don't you see him? And the Sultan's groom, Turned upside down by the genie. There he is upon his head. Serve him right. I'm glad of it. What business had he to be married to the princess? There's the parrot. Green body and yellow tail with a thing like a lettuce coming out of the top of his head. There he is. Poor Robin Crusoe, he called him when he came home again after sailing round the island. Poor Robin Crusoe. Where have you been, Robin Crusoe? The man thought he was dreaming, but he wasn't. It was the parrot, you know. There goes Friday, running for his life to the little creek. Poor boy. I wish. But it's, but it's too late now. What is the matter? Nothing. Nothing. There was a girl singing a Christmas carol at my door last night. I should like to have given her something. That's all. Let us see another Christmas. Dear, dear brother, I have come to bring you home, dear brother. To bring you home. 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 Home, little fan? Yes, home. For good and all. Home forever and ever. Father is so much kinder than he used to be, that home's like heaven. He spoke so gently to me one dear night when I was going to bed, that I was not afraid to ask him once more if you might come home. And he said yes, you should, and sent me in a coach to bring you. And you're to be a man, and are never to come back here. But first, we're to be together all the Christmas long, and have the merriest time in all the world. You are quite a woman, little fan. Come, come, let's go. All was a delicate creature, 
whom a breath might have withered. But she had a large heart. So she had. You're right. I'll not gainsay it, spirit. God forbid. She died a woman, and had, as I think, children. One child. True. Your nephew. Yes. This warehouse. Do you know it? Know it? Was I apprenticed here? Why, it's old Fezziwig! Bless his heart, it's Fezziwig alive again! Dick Wilkins, to be sure! Bless me, yes, there he is! He was very much attached to me, was Dick. Poor Dick. Yes, sir. Dear, dear. Hylio, clear away, my lads, and let's have lots of room here. Hylio, Dick. Cheer up, Ebenezer! Oh, Fezziwig. Never did a man throw a party like good old Fezziwig. A small matter to make these silly folks so full of gratitude. He has spent but a few pounds of your mortal money. Three or four, perhaps. Is that so much? that he deserves this praise. It isn't that. It isn't that, spirit. He has the power to render us happy or unhappy, to make our service light or burdensome, a pleasure or a toil. Say that his power lies in words and looks, in things so slight and insignificant that it is impossible to add and count them up. What then? The happiness he gives is quite as great as if it cost a fortune. What is the matter? Nothing in particular. Something, I think. No, no. I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just now. That's all. My time grows short. Quick! Another idol has displaced me. And if it can cheer and comfort you in time to come, as I would have tried to do, I have no just cause to grieve. What idol has displaced you? A golden one. This is the even-handed dealing of the world. There is nothing on which it is so hard as poverty, and there is nothing it professes to condemn with such severity as the pursuit of wealth. You fear the world too much. All your other hopes have merged into the hope of being beyond the chance of its sordid reproach. I have seen your nobler aspirations fall off one by one until the master passion, gain, engrosses you. Have I not? What then? Even if I have grown so much wiser, what then? I am not changed towards you. Am I? Our contract is an old one. It was made when we were both poor and content to be so, until, in good season, we could improve our worldly fortune by our patient industry. You are changed when it was made. You were another man. I was a boy. Your own feeling tells you that you were not what you are. I am. That which promised happiness when we were one in heart is fraught with misery now that we are two. How often and how keenly I have thought of this, I will not say. It is enough that I have thought of it and can release you. Have I ever sought release? In words, no. Never. In what, then? 
in a changed nature, in an altered spirit, in another atmosphere of life, another hope as its great end, in everything that made my love of any worth or value in your sight. If this had never been between us, tell me, would you seek me out and try to win me now? <gasps> no. You think not? I would gladly think otherwise if I could, heaven knows. When I have learned a truth like this, I know how strong and irresistible it must be. But if you were free today, tomorrow, yesterday, can even I believe that you would choose a dowerless girl? You who, in your very confidence with her, weigh everything by gain, or choosing her, if for a moment you were false enough to your one guiding principle to do so, do I not know that your repentance and regret would surely follow? I do. And I release you with a full heart for the love of him you once were. You may, the memory of what is past half makes me hope you will, have pain in this. A very, very brief time. And you will dismiss the recollection of it gladly as an unfortunate dream from which it happened well that you awoke. May you be happy in the life you have chosen. Spirit, show me no more. Conduct me home. Why do you delight to torture me? One shadow more. No more. No more. I don't wish to see it. Show me no more. Merry Christmas. And I've got presents for all of you. <laughs> now upstairs with all of you. I need to give your mother a Christmas kiss. Bill, I saw an old friend of yours this afternoon. Who was it? Guess. How can I? Don't I know? <laughs> Mr Scrooge. Mr Scrooge it was. I passed his office window and as it was not shut up and he had a candle inside, I could scarcely help seeing him. His partner lies upon the point of death I hear. And there he sat alone, quite alone in the world, I do believe. Spirit, remove me from this place. I told you these were shadows of the things that have been, that they are what they are. Do not blame me. Remove me. I cannot bear it. Leave me. Take me back. Haunt me no longer. Ah, Dickens, he likes to leave you with a bit of a cliffhanger. But come back next week, we'll be having Stave 3. And remember, if you want to pre-order it, go to anotherworldaudiobooks.com. And uh, your pre-order is going to go to help support Operation Christmas Child. So I thank you so much in advance for your support. And most of all, for spreading the word. Because if you donate, that is fantastic. But if you tell three people about this and they all donate, and you donate, like then it, they tell some more people. I mean, they'll just keep spreading and spreading. And that's what we want to happen. So go ahead, tell people about it. I've been putting a bunch of stuff on on my social media, Another World Audiobooks um, social media, you can find all the links down below. Uh, if you want to jump on there and share that stuff around, that's probably the easiest way to get other people uh, get their attention on this. So go ahead and do that. Spread the word about this and uh, yeah, just get it out there. I don't, I don't know of a better way to spread some Christmas cheer here this year. So thank you so much for listening and I want to say a huge thank you again to the voice actors who made this possible. Um, each and every one of them volunteered their time. This was not a, not a paid gig. Uh, nobody's getting money out of this. We're just doing this because we want to support Operation Christmas Child. So thank you to each and every one of those voice actors 
those who made this possible. Um, yeah, I, I could not be more grateful for, for the time and effort they put into this. It really is incredible to see everybody come together and make magic like this happen. So, um, are you enjoying this? I hope you are enjoying this. If so, I want to hear from you. Please get in touch with me, anotherworldaudiobooks at gmail.com. All the social media uh, links are down below as well. I would love to hear from you and just get your thoughts on this. Uh, remember, we will be coming back to The Hound of the Baskervilles and carrying on with that Sherlock Holmes mystery um, and our reg regular scheduled program after Christmas. Uh, so we're doing uh, each uh, week uh, leading up to Christmas here, we're doing a stave of a Christmas carol. So much fun. And then we'll be getting back into The Hound of the Baskervilles. And then we'll be actually wrapping that audiobook up pretty soon after that. So um, yeah, there's just a lot of good stuff coming. I've already got ideas with all these awesome voice actors. I think there's uh, a lot more cool stuff that we could do. If you are new to the podcast, remember to check out the backlist. There are hundreds, over 150 episodes of audiobook goodness there for you to check out all for free on the podcast. If you want to support the podcast, you can do that at anchor.fm slash another world audiobooks, and you can just uh, click on support this podcast there. Um, and yeah, this is just a labor of love, me just doing this, and I and could not be more appreciative to the people who have stepped up to support the podcast. A huge, huge thank you to Aaron, Ediosa, Mike, Corky, and John for supporting the podcast. I could not do this without you, and I just love you guys so much. Thank you so much for your generous donations to the podcast. And remember, if you want to support the podcast and get something in return, the best way to do that is to uh, go to anotherworldaudiobooks.com. You scroll down a little bit, you'll see purchase audiobooks, and there's also a link to purchase merch. That's something I haven't uh, plugged very much, but you can you can purchase audiobooks directly from me, and that goes to support the podcast, or you can go and, uh, and purchase merchandise as well got some cool t-shirts with some cool custom designs that i've made and that sort of thing so go ahead and check that out at anotherworldaudiobooks.com so yeah thank you guys so much for listening i am so looking forward to stave three here coming up next week in the meantime i will again be trying to do some more of those listener interviews i wasn't really able to do that last week with thanksgiving and all that sort of thing but definitely going to be making that a priority to get to so you can meet some more of the cast it's just so much fun to work with these awesome people and hope you are enjoying the awesome results of their labor so Thanks again for listening. Remember to share the podcast with somebody that you know who might enjoy a free audiobook. We'll talk to you next week.